Council agenda meeting of August 11th, August 11th, 2020. Introduction, posting of notice. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in accordance with the requirements of the open public meetings law by filing the notice in the office of the township clerk and by posting the meeting notice on the bulletin board of the municipal building on December 18th, 2019, where it has remained posted since that date. A legal notice appeared in the daily record in the Newark Star Ledger on December 23rd, 2019, and was forwarded by fax to other local newspapers and local radio stations on December 18th, 2019. No, council meetings are videotaped and aired on Cablevision Public Access Channel 21 at 11 a.m. on Sundays and are also available for viewing at www.parsippity.net. Uh, at this time, um, I know the mayor has the flag visible in his office, so as long as the council president is okay with it, I'll turn it over to the mayor to lead the flag salute. Council president? Fine. Go ahead, mayor. You there? Mayor? I just needed to unmute. I pledge allegiance to the flag to the of the United States of America, States of America and, to and to the republic, to the republic for which, which it stands, stands one nation one under God, nation. indivisible, with liberty, liberty justice, and justice, for all. Okay, thank you, man. You're welcome. My pleasure. Uh, roll call. <clears throat> Mr. Carifi? Here. Mr. Carifi? Here. Ms. Grignani? Here. Ms. McCarthy? Here. Ms. Peterson? Here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Mr. DePiro? Here. Okay. Also in attendance are Mayor Michael Soriano, Business Administrator Keith Kazmark, and Township Attorney Jim Lott. Are you there? Jim? Okay, well, uh, maybe we can't hear him. We'll work on that. CFO Ann Cucci and Township Clerk Colette Madden. Uh, Council President, we have a forum. Can I begin? Um, clerk? Yes. I don't see Mr. Jim Lott on the, uh, on the panel. Okay, I'm going to try to contact him. But in the meantime, uh, just for the public certification, we'll go through uh, the upcoming meetings and the approval of minutes. Hey, hey, is that Mr. Lott? Uh, is uh, Mr. Kazmark there? I'm here, Colette. Uh, Mr. Kazmark, well, well, just since I'm reading the agenda, may I ask you to try to contact Mr. Lott? Sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, upcoming meetings, August 18th, 2020, at 7 p.m. regular meeting. August 1st, 2020, at 7 p.m. agenda meeting. Our four minutes, we have the agenda meeting of July 7th, 2020. At this time, we're going to move to the presentations and reports. Uh, Mayor? Thank you, Clerk. Um, before I get to the, 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 the crux of it, this, uh, I believe um, this past week has been um, quite trying for the Township of Parsippany, not just dealing with the pandemic, but also dealing with power outages. And to that end, I um, mailed out and sent out this letter to Charles Jones, the Chief Executive Officer of the First Energy Corp. They're the ones that own JCPNL, and Joseph Fiordaliso. Uh, he's the president of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. I'd like to read this into the record. Dear Mr. Jones and President Fiordaliso, about 70% of Parsippany residents lost power as a result of the tropical storm Isaias. Over half of our township was out of power for at least two days, and thousands of residences and businesses did not see their power restored for four, five, or even six days. This occurred during the course of a global pandemic that has left many residents dependent on household power to work, conduct business, educate their children, and care for their loved ones. Our society has never been more dependent on stable, reliable electricity than in the year 2020. This outage is more than any other in recent memory and has brought into focus the need to change the way we think about utility operations and infrastructure moving forward. Now, earlier this week, Bergen County Executive Jim Tedesco called on PSENG, which serves his region, to reimburse customers for the cost of food, 
medication, and other perishables for both residents and businesses which lost power for 48 hours or more during last week's storm. He further called on the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities to make this a requirement in the case of future outages. I am in lockstep with the supporters of this idea, and I'm joining this call to action, and as an electrician by trade, I understand the difficulties surrounding our power grill. However, most of the residents of Parsippany experience a severe and unnecessary hardship in the aftermath of Tropical Storm Isaias. In the midst of a global pandemic, it, now, this, the aftermath, I, I've heard from hundreds of residents over the last week who are justifiably angry with JCPNL's response. Now that the power is fully restored, further action on your part is needed. The concept is not without precedent. Con Edison is offering this program to their customers as I write this letter. I implore you to ensure that JCPNL does the same. Now, as one of the few electricians serving as mayor in the state of New Jersey, I would also like to offer my constructive thoughts on improvements to our power grid. This is not a comprehensive plan, but a few key suggestions to start mitigating the number of outages we experience and the length of time before restoration. Item one, accelerate the installation of trip saver smart reset devices. Now, trip savers can save time, equipment costs, and labor costs. After the initial investment, labor and repair costs will decrease substantially, as will the time it takes for customers to be restored to power. Make our substations more resilient to extreme weather conditions. My understanding is that for the first few days of the outage, it was the, due to the extensive damage that our substations that delayed the response to neighborhood outages as hubs of power generation and a more resistant class of substations will leave more customers with power following major storms and accelerate restoration times for those who do lose power. Item three, installation of smart utility poles. Let's keep in mind that Samuel Morse install, installed the first utility poles in 1840. Other than weather treatment, this system has seen little change since that time that we have here in Morris County. Smart utility poles will both accelerate the troubleshooting process and vastly improve monitoring capabilities over the grid. All of these ideas, as well as many others that are useful and necessary, will require an investment on the part of JCPNL. Given the extensive damage done by what was a rel relatively quick storm, these investments are necessary and the BPU must act to ensure these changes are made. Our residents, your customers, deserve better. I hope you will take this letter seriously and begin to implement new businesses practices to tangibly improve the outcomes for families in your service area. Sincerely, Michael Soriano, Mayor. Mr. Clerk, that concludes my report. Thank you for your time. If I may respond, uh, I think uh, that's a well-written letter. Not only are you complaining about the outages, but you're offering suggestions for improvement. Uh, Thank I've, you, I've Mr. Council you. President. I've had lots of complaints um, and that the head of JCPNL should resign and, and those kind of complaints, but yours actually suggests solutions, long-term solutions. That's good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. If I might as well, could you just explain smart utility poles? Sure. Um, let's start off with the fact that the utility poles that we have in Morris County are wood, okay? Um, that's the same type of utility pole put up in 1840. Right now, they're wood that are weather treated, and that wood doesn't even decompose. It's useless. There, there, there are stacks of it that are just stacked up. They, they're horrible for the environment. Number one, um, they are vulnerable to the to the uh, storm damage as well. Now, these smart poles, they, they, they do them from poly alloys, concrete, uh, super plastics. There's all different types of material they can make them from. But these smart poles are capable of communicating with a central system and telling central system or dispatch where the problems are, where the outages are. These smart systems are also capable of shooting a signal through the wire that estimates the distance of the wire where the breakage is and can tell the central station where the power breakage is. So there's this way, what, they don't have to send someone around in a truck to visually inspect it in bad weather or in the rain or in the darkness. They know more or less where the broken uh, line is. That's part of the smart poles. Um, and, and again, it can also help them monitor 
the grid and monitor which customers are exactly out instead of waiting for customers to call in so they know where the breakage is. We're basically, this grid was put in by my guess in the 40s and the 50s. I mean, most of Lake Hiawatha started getting built, I think, in the 30s. You have Lake Parsippany, which is built in the 50s. There hasn't been an upgrade in the style and in the change. And the utility poles that were put up in those eras did not change in the 50 years that utility poles were really became more common in, in, in our region. So a smarter system is needed. An upgrade yeah. is needed. So that's what the smart utility poles are. Yeah, you know, the other... Go ahead, Janice. No, I was just going to say, I think one of the issues is... Um, you know, how about having these uh, tree removal services work with the utility? I mean, they don't seem to be working together, you know, uh, and, and some process, you know, I mean, I think that's up to JCP&L, but, you know, to have have that available on, on Route 53, for example, there's still tree limbs hanging and on, on wires, you know, yeah, are, that, we that's... Waiting, or are we just waiting for that to, to fall? I mean, you know, that hasn't been picked up yet. And I know I don't know if that's their responsibility. Do you see it as their responsibility? Uh, in, in many cases, as soon as that tree is hanging on the wire, the township can't touch that. I mean, we don't have guys licensed for that. That's that's. Right. I, I believe that's within their purview. Now, keep in mind, you have hit on one of the strengths of Parsippany, which is that we are a tree city, which makes us very attractive. You know that we have so many trees, but as we see in the case of the storm. It has its drawbacks as well, serious drawbacks. Now, I will tell you, there's certain areas that I saw on Vale Road where they were doing tree removal and, you know, vegetation, you know, management this past last summer. And uh, th th actually this past spring where there were no outages along that line. Thank goodness. So some of the vegetation management that they've taken part of has helped. But Janice, as you're squarely put it, pointing out, it's probably not enough. Yeah. One of the one of the suggestions that was made, probably before your time, Mayor, we discussed it a number of times, is that if Parks and Forestry goes out to remove some trees, and there's a downed wire in that vicinity, they're not allowed to go in and clear the trees until JCP and L comes out and certifies that the wire is dead. Now, not only they, are they not allowed, the certification to work with High voltage electricity like that and just working around it is an annual certification and is very expensive to maintain. Well, the suggestion was um, that we have that, in fact, uh, Jimmy Walsh is the one who suggested yeah. it. Have three Jimmy or four, and I discussed this. Only three or four or five of his uh, people uh, certified, and that will save a lot of time uh, where they can remove trees and let JCP not get it there sooner even with a downed wire, because they will be certified to handle it. Agreed. Now, that would be a time saver for JCP&L and the residents, but it would be an expense for the township. I don't know what it costs to certify them, but we're not talking about this whole department. We're talking so, about a select few. So here's what I understand, okay? And again, I here's what I understand, and again, I need to still verify this, okay? That the priorities that they had at the time that repairing the lines that are out in the neighborhoods okay was not as high of a priority because they needed to focus on the substations okay yes. that is the equivalent the substation think of the substation as a heart that's pumping blood Understood. and that line that's all the way down the line that's the vein in your arm so their thought is why bother repairing the vein in the arm because that's not going to restore power right away repair the heart first. So they were focusing all of their labor, and, and, and all of their fine. resources there. Understood, and that's fine. That's, that's the correct process. But in the meantime, in the meantime, streets are blocked by trees, Yep. with some downed wires, and our guys, if they were certified, could go out and remove those trees from the road. So when JC Pinnell gets to those roads, they'll be cleared. Mm -hmm. So it saves time in that respect. But we would need a few of our people to be certified. This is Council Member Peterson. I just want to jump in. I think the mayor, the letter that you wrote articulates what we were all thinking. So thank you for writing and sending that. 
Um, and I think the smart polls and the certification all sound excellent. I want to know what are the costs associated because we have no shortage of good ideas, but when we look in our own backyard to improve infrastructure, we don't have the money and aren't willing to pay the higher rates. So while we can say there are these solutions available, that may be true, but I would like to start preparing the residents for what that will look like in their bill because we're not going to get those improvements or certifications free of charge. Now, I agree with Councilwoman Peterson, uh, Council Member Peterson on that. Um, the thing is, I, I, I can understand JCPNL wanting to put a modest increase on the residents, but I don't think the taxpayers, our residents, should bear the burden. I don't I, disagree, I, and I think I, a, a bigger national conversation of you know infrastructure investment is happening in pockets of uh, in Washington, right. and hopefully this will be tied to that. I would Good. agree with you. Good. Okay. Anyone else? Janice, uh, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. I, I think this has to be a national conversation because I think they need support from the federal government to do these infrastructure repairs. These storms are not going to get better, and we all know that. They're going to get worse. So unless we're prepared to deal with them, this is going to be a nightmare, particularly for a town like ours. This uh, outage, Janice is right, this outage was 70%. That storm we had two years ago in March, we were at, I think, 65 or 68%. I might be a little incorrect on that number, but this was this was a rougher storm in a shorter amount of time. Right. And I mean, and they're going to be, we're going to see them in a shorter amount of time. Yeah. So, so, you know, I mean, that's that's a matter of fact. So we've seen it already, you know. I mean, I, I've never heard of so many instances on the weather of tornadoes in the area as I have this year. And, and uh, you know, we get a tornado. You know, I guess we're we out of business for a while. Okay. So I, I think it's just an infrastructure problem. And I think GCPNL hasn't yet given anybody a strategy of what they plan to do and that's that's kind of all i have to say <laughs> councilwoman Grignani, uh mayor um this past week there have been uh the outages over at vale manor uh with the tree that's on vale road that was uh, on a pole and the wires were out i know the um our emo Oh, I'm sorry. OEM, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They uh they contacted the county, the county OEM and asked if they would make Vale Manor a priority. Um I was wondering, there are seniors there and uh of course everything was out. The elevators, the hallway lights, the, their their apartments. I'm wondering if any effort was made to see that these residents uh whether they be seniors or not i know they did they need some assistance maybe going to the cooling center or do they need food um i don't know whether anyone went there and uh can we possibly if and when this ever happens again that we will take our most vulnerable residents and possibly help them for them to be alone for these five days that they were out I think is it was frightening. I know yes. some ambulance calls and there was some police uh, presence there that they were called. Um, I'm just wondering if we could, if this ever happens again, to please let's see if maybe we could get the management and, and check on, on these residents, knock on doors and see how they're doing. Thank you. That is a very good suggestion. We did have the... Um cooling center slash recharging center at the community center. Um, and this is a good point to, uh, by the way, thank the council uh, for approving my administration's plans to put a very powerful, very resilient generator system at the community center. So that way the most vulnerable people could get, in the worst of weather, could get uh, their phones charged or stay warm or stay cool depending on the weather uh, there at the community center, which also houses our health department. Uh, and at one of the ambulance squads, which that, that right now is our most resilient building. We, uh, we certainly need work, have work to do. 
when it comes to the police station and uh, town hall as well to use that as cooling and warming centers as well. Um, we'll talk more about that for next year's budget. Okay, um, seeing no thoughts, we're going to move right along. Uh, next report is our township attorney, uh, Jim Lott. Mr. Lott. I have no report. Thank you, Jim. Uh, okay, moving along. Mr. Uh, our business administrator, Mr. Kazmark. Thank you, Colin. Um, I think the mayor covered uh, much of what needed to be covered with regard to the storm. I just want to encourage residents, if we do have uh, fallen debris, uh, tree limbs or brush that needs to be picked up, please just pull it curbside and be patient with the pickup schedule. It's going to take a while to get through the entire township. Um, but um, yeah, that's the only other announcement I want to add to the. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Kazmark. Um, all right, uh, I do not have a report at this time. Uh, Township Officers of Committees from the Council. Any reports for the Officers of Committees? Just one report. Is, um, the um, Pressman Farms uh, had a, a tree down and power down, um, and the Township helped them with a, a loan of a generator. In fact, they took the generator that was loaned that was up at the knoll and moved it over to help them help them out. Um, fortunately, the, the tree did not damage the historic house right next to it, but it did not damage it. Um, and they will be coming, Vaughn will be coming to give a, a presentation, a virtual presentation at our next meeting next week. Thank you, Council President. Um, at this time, moving right along to the engineering report, I will go ahead and read the report into the record. Uh, 2020 road resurfacing curb and sidewalk program construction began in mid July and will continue through the beginning of September no council action required. Green bank road safety and improvements project. The project is sub substantially complete and only minor punch list items remain to be completed. We anticipate closing out the project by middle of August. No council action required. Various streets reconstruction project. The various streets reconstruction project is substantially complete and all punch list items will be completed by the middle of August. No council action required. New England drive milling and paving project. The New England drive milling and paving project will begin construction the week of July 27th. The work is planned to continue through the beginning of September. No council action required. Simpson Avenue retaining wall project. The Simpson Avenue retaining wall project construction start date has been delayed, but construction is scheduled to start the week of July 27th. Work is planned to continue through August. No council action required. Veterans Park Culvert Replacement Project. Bids were received for the Veterans Park Culvert Replacement Project. The lowest responsible bid is acceptable, and we have recommended award of the project at the August Council meeting. Construction will begin in the middle of October. A resolution will need to be adopted by the Township Council. Mount Tabor Streets Improvement Project, uh, Phase 5. Mount Tabor Streets Improvements Phase 5 project was bid in July, and we have recommended award of the project at the August Council meeting. Construction is anticipated to begin in September. Our resolution will need to be adopted by the Township Council. Roadway design projects. The following projects are in design. Putting Stone Heights road improvements in the various culvert repair project. These projects will be bid once design documents are finalized. Construction is, is anticipated to start later in the summer. No council action required. Community paying system, CRS program. We continue to work with our consultant and the NJDEP to get back into the CRS program. This program provides discounts on flood insurance policies based on level of activities in which the township participates. The work will continue through at least the end of this year. No council action required. At this time, we're moving right along to bids. Bids taken. Uh, July 22nd, 2020, the well drilling and install installation services replacement production well 21-R. Number two, July 23rd, 2020, reconstruction of various streets in Mount Tabor, phase five. July 24th, 2020, lease on public property. Bids to be taken. August 12th, 2020, one new 2021 16 Freightliner M2 112 extended cab with crane for Parsippany Rescue and Recovery Squad. August 19th, 2020, clarifier improvements. Quotations, proposal qualifications, none. At this time, we are moving along to the public hearing. So I will go ahead and entertain a motion to open up the public hearing. Make a motion. Can I please have a second? Second. Okay. Motion made by uh, Mr. Kariffi, seconded by Ms. McCarthy. Roll call. Mr. Kariffi? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Giani? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ms. McCarthy? Yes. 
Ms. Peterson? Yes. Mr. DePiro? Yes. Okay. At this time, the floor is open to the public on any matter. Uh, to the public, I'm addressing the public at this point. You should see a, a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and I will make sure that you are unmuted. Any member of the public will have five minutes to speak. Okay, I, uh, at this point, I see Kandolsky has his hand raised. So, uh, Ken, uh, let's unmute Ken. Yes, can you hear me? Ken, how are you today? Good, can you, you can hear me? We can hear you, you have five minutes. Oh, great, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Ken Kandolsky, 21 Winfield Drive. Uh, three quick things. First of all, thank you very, very much uh, to the mayor and the council for addressing the power resiliency issue. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more that can be done that I think many people uh, understand, including me. And uh, it's interesting and un exci kind of exciting to know, you know how much improved this could be. Um, my thinking on this is that uh, you should target the VPU and work with other towns and form as big a coalition as you can and ask the VPU to step in and force First Energy and JCP&L to make as many upgrades and improvements as they possibly can. That uh, they're a private company um, and just, you know, force them to do it. They've gotten away for a long time without investing in any of these things. And so, you know, now it's time for them to invest. Um, second, um, and you can answer this when I finish, but I just had a quick question. I noticed that in on the consent agenda, there's an item number six, that's a settlement. And I just wondered what you can tell me about that or what you can tell us about that and how much that's costing the town. Uh, third, I would just like to observe as uh, I've been following the, uh, you know, the steady stream of new COVID infections in the town. Um, it's not big, but it is steady. And once again, I would ask that uh, you, you could bring in the health department, somebody from the health department to the next meeting and have that person explain exactly what without revealing any HIPAA information, but tell us what's going on, why is this happening, where is it happening, and anything else that you can you can help us understand what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Ken, are you there? Yes. Uh, I had, uh, I don't know, I had sent you an email with regards to that resolution on the consent agenda. Did you receive that email? Uh, no. You did not? No. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and send you that email now, uh, read it, and if you have any other questions, I'll ask you to speak with our township attorney offline because I, I believe I sent you the email, so I think that email will answer all your questions. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, at this time, um, let's go ahead and uh, unmute uh, Bob Venezia. Hi, uh, Bob Venezzi here, 102 Brook Lawn Drive. Can you hear me? Yes, Bob, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, at the July 9th special council meeting, we heard about monetary shortfalls in our water and sewer budgets. The utility consultant identified rising expenses and surplus transfers as the two main causes of the problems that exist in both budgets. His proposed solution was to one, raise utility rates by 39% for 2020, and then two, raise utility rates by five to 8% for each of the following four years. Unfortunately, although the consultant very accurately described the roots of the utility budget problems, his plan of action did not address either one of them. My suggestion to the administration and to the council is to reject any plan such as the consultants that simply brings in more revenue without solving the underlying problems that are causing the, these revenue shortfalls. The first problem identified by the consultant was rising expenses. In the short term, the consultants proposed rate hikes would increase utility revenues by a significant amount. 
if the expenses continue to rise at his projected rate of 6 to 8%, then the proposed utility rate increase of 5 to 8% annually for four years will have to be extended to 5 to 8% annually forever. In the long term, there needs to be some kind of plan to reduce out of control utility expenses. If general budget expenses were increasing 6 to 8% a year, you'd be forced to reduce them to stay within a 2% cap. The same fiscal discipline should be applied to the utility budgets, starting with salaries and wages. For example, in the last three years, salaries and wages in the water department, and this is, I have, there's a column on the chart that I gave you for salary and wages. Uh, it's uh, under budget appropriations, second column under budget appropriations. Um, the salary and wages have increased by an average of 7.7% .7 over the last three years. In the prior 10 years before that, the average increase was just 1% per year. In a stable environment such as the water utility, I don't see how a labor increase of 23% over three years can be justified. And to use terminology that we hear a lot lately, it's unsustainable. The consultants proposed rate hikes also fail to address the second fundamental problem that jeopardizes the utility budgets, and that is the surplus transfers to the general budget. Again, in the short term, the extra revenue from the rate hikes make the surplus transfers less painful. But the two and a half million dollar annual withdrawals will continue to be a drain on future utility budgets and a scapegoat for future utility rate increases. Parsippany doesn't need any more short-term solutions. It's the general budget, not the utility budgets, where the administration and the council should first direct their attention. Increasing revenues in the general budget by a sufficient amount to eliminate the transfers will repair that budget once and for all and at the same time will strengthen the utility budgets by allowing them to retain an extra two and a half million of their own money each year. If you take care of business on the general budget side first, a utility rate increase may not even be necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and mute Bob. Okay, at this point, I see uh, Nick Homiak, his hand is up. Let's go ahead and unmute Nick. Nick? Can you hear me, Nick? Okay, I believe you're muted, Nick. Okay, you're unmuted now. Go ahead, Nick. So Nick, uh, just so you know, you might be using the wrong microphone. If you can hear me on your uh, on your laptop, you might want to try to switch the microphone. We'll give you a couple minutes, Nick. You there, Nick? All right, we'll wait another minute or so. Again, Nick, if you, uh, you can hear me. Right now, you're muted.
So, Nick, if you can hear me, on the bottom next to the part, on the bottom next to the, uh, you should have three dots for more options. And there you can pick your microphone and, and camera. You can change it. So, if you look at the three dots on the bottom, it should give you that option. You there? Okay, we'll wait about another minute for you, Nick. Again, Nick, if you can hear me, on your screen, on the bottom, you should see um, like a circle with three dots. And that, if you click on that circle, it should give you the option of selecting a microphone. Okay, in the meantime, I'm going to see if any, anybody else has their hand up and would like to speak. Okay, there's no one else with their hand up at this point. We'll give you a, one more minute, Nick, and then we're going to have to move on. Nick, if you have the office line, if you want to call into the office, I can give you that option as well. And you can speak on speaker. You've called my office before. You have that number. If you want to call in right now, I will put you on speaker, and this way you can speak if you can hear me, Nick. Okay, just uh, we'll wait one last minute for Nick. Nick, you there? Yes. All right. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. No clue what I'm doing wrong here. All right. Um, yeah, everybody can hear me. So go ahead, Nick. Um, I'm interested in the Nick, re, uh, do me a favor. Smith production well, and uh, was is this particular well? Uh, has to be replaced due to depletion or contamination. And uh, hey, Nick, 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 I made an observation, and this is ongoing, not not only in Persephone, but we have people cutting the grass. They had the guys out on Route 46 on the 28th, and they're cutting the, uh, the blue flowers. I think they call them chicory flowers. And what they do 
is they don't police the trash before they cut the grass. And this is a common practice all over. But if we allow all these franchises and all these materials, these single-use plastics, we have to be responsible for the end result. And the, the proper way to do the job is if you're going to police uh, cut the grass, you're going to have to police the trash. So that's uh, kind of disappointing when I see that they pretend like it's not there. Um, the, a remark about the power company, they call it a public utility, but it's, it's really not. It's a for-profit. So a lot of the money goes upstairs to the stockholders and the CEO, CEOs, and they don't do any uh, upgrades or proper maintenance. It's like a breakdown type of maintenance, and with uh, with electricity, that 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 you shouldn't be allowed. And I agree with everything that Mayor Soriano uh, said. I'd like to read something here, and then I'll um, I'm, I'll end it. Even the modest in, increase in the total tax burden on the top one percent of earners to a forty five percent rate, far lower than its post war than the post war levels, would bring an additional two hundred and seventy. Five billion in revenue. That's far more than just the forty-seven billion needed to make all public colleges and universities tuition-free. Such increases also go a long way in generating the revenue needed to finance a universal health care system, increase Social Security benefits and rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. So it is a central problem in the way we run this country. So. All right, uh, thank you, Nick. All right, and don't forget the two questions I asked. All right, reiterate the questions, please. All right, good night. Wait, Nick, you there? Okay, uh, if you had heard his two questions, I don't know if you did. But at this point in time, we're going to see if there are any members, uh, any other members of the public that want to speak. Okay, seeing no other members of the public. Khaled, uh, Nick's two questions were one was about the well and why is the well, I believe that's on tonight's agenda, was it because of public or, uh, pollution or contamination? And the other question was the status of the knoll and the river friendly uh, pesticide usage, I believe, if I understood him correctly. And thank you very much. an update on both things. Thank you very much, Councilmember Peterson. Any, uh, with that said, anybody wants to address Nick's two questions? So I, I, will, uh, I will do my best. Um, the well infrastructure. Um, it's not with regard to contamination, it's, regard, it's with regard to the actual physical infrastructure of the well um, that needs to be rebuilt. Unfortunately, the bid that came in that's being rejected on tonight's consent agenda came in well over the engineer's estimate. I uh, sat with uh, John over at the water department, and we have uh, come up with some ways to try to cut down um, some of the improvements in the bid. Uh, that would cut down on the costs. Uh, it won't affect the lifespan of the well, but he has made some cutbacks with Mike Hardy to the bid spec in order to try to bring the next <laughs> round of bidding in lower than we received this time. Um, with regard to the, uh, the use of pesticides, uh, the administration is working on a policy with regard to that. We've had meetings not only with the folks up at the Knoll, I know Mr. Brancato is on the, uh, the call tonight, uh, but we've also met with uh, Jim Walsh from Parks and Forestry uh, to talk about how we can potentially do an effective job of weed management and the like, um, and what products are environmentally friendly and not have any long-term negative effects on the environment. So that's where we are with both of those issues. Thank you, Mr. Kazmark. 
Okay, uh, at this time, uh, seeing no one, uh, no other member of the public's hand is up, I'll just double check one last time. Okay, we have no other member of the public's hands up. So at this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to close the public hearing, please. Make a motion. Second. Okay, a motion made by Mr. Karippi, seconded by Ms. McCarthy. Roll call. Mr. Karippi? Yes. Ms. Grignani? Yes. Ms. McCarthy? Yes. Ms. Peterson? Yes. Mr. DePiro? Yes. Okay. At this time, moving right along to ordinances, I would like uh, at this time, Colette, before you do that, if I may, sure. Um, I, I just want to be able to respond very briefly uh, with the council president's permission uh, to Mr. Dolsky and uh, Mr. Kizia. Um, in regard to uh, Ken's question, I'll defer to Jim Lott on item six, although I believe Colette already sent correspondence to him addressing that particular issue. Yes, I did. It's already handled. Okay. And then with regard to the COVID cases, um, I do receive uh, every day a report from Carlo, our health officer, uh, updating us with the amount of COVID cases. Um, we get one every other day on average. I would say that it's a lot. Uh, we can certainly invite Carlo to come to a future meeting if the council president desires to do so, and I'm sure he'll be glad to attend. But I just want to stress that there are no specific areas of town that have clusters or areas where there is an outbreak, so to speak, of COVID cases. The only place that that type of description would even apply was in any type of assisted or senior living facilities, and that was at the height of the pandemic. Um, at this point, these cases, and I don't have specific address, but as Carlo has indicated to me in the past, they are spread out through the township, and obviously the, the proper contact tracing is being done uh, to alert people who the uh, positive case may have come in contact with uh, for days before that. So I just wanted to stress that. Uh, with regard to Mr. Venezia's comments about the integrity of uh, the three utilities, um, I can tell you, Bob, that in my opinion, and I think Ann Clucci would agree with me on this, um, our water department um, runs on a very, very small staff for the amount of services that that utility needs to provide. Uh, to, quite frankly, I don't think that the staff at the water department is actually adequate, um, but we've asked John to run uh, on a very lean operating budget, and that includes operations. It also includes personnel. With regard to the percentages that you cite, um, when I arrived here, one of the things that I inherited, and I think that, that it, it, was a, um, it is a positive thing, so I don't want anybody to cast any dispersions on what I'm about to say, but in the previous contract governing the blue collar workers in Parsippany, there was a step chart that was put <laughs> into effect uh, because quite frankly, all of the laborers in Parsippany throughout the blue collar departments uh, are very low paying positions. And the township was having a difficulty retaining employees because they would come here for a few years and then they would get more lucrative opportunities, you know, um, in other fields or in other blue collar positions, um, both in the private and public sector. One of the things that I was directed to do by the administration and also by the council when we negotiated the rank and file blue collar contract was to maintain that step guide so that we could try to, over a longer period of time, retain those employees and incentivize them to stay. It was a challenge to have to train new people every few years to do many of these, many of these jobs. So that is one of the reasons that that percentage may look high, but in fact, it has to do with that step guide uh, that we're trying to incentivize people who are not in high paying positions to stay here with the township moving forward. So I just wanted to clarify uh, that piece of what Bob brought forward. With regard to the utility transfers, there's no one who agrees with what he said more than myself. Um, I, have, I have cautioned um, the township about continuing to move those amounts of money over from the utility surpluses over into the operating fund since I've been here, uh, knowing that at some point uh, it was not going to be sustainable to continue to do so. And I think that's one of the reasons that the council is currently considering what they're gonna do with regard to rate adjustments, both in water and sewer. And the only other thing I will say is that with regard to staffing, um, I also think that the Knoll facility is understaffed. 
I've had many conversations with Kevin Brancato and, and Matt Seacrest up there. Uh, we do not have adequate staff if you compare us to other golf courses in the area, uh, from the greens to the building and grounds folks, uh, to the, the people who are in the public service piece of it, uh, servicing the, uh, the golfers that are there. Um, we do not compare with the amount of employees that other golf courses have to maintain uh, those two beautiful courses up in the country. So I just wanted to be clear that we are not overstaffed in any of the utilities, but most especially water or golf. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Keith, for that. Well, like, can I ask Keith one quick follow up question regarding the COVID cases? And uh, I is contact tracing something that's handled at the municipal level? And if so, is that something that our health inspector could speak to if he was to come before council? Through you, uh, Council President, uh, to Council Member Peterson. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, our health department has been working nonstop with the help of some of the employees from human services uh, to uh, they were trained and have uh, gone through a series of months now of doing contact tracing on every single case uh, that uh, involves a Parsippany resident. And yes, uh, if if the invitation is extended to Carlo, I'm sure he would be happy to share that process with you. Thank you. Any other member of council? Colette, maybe you should put that on the agenda for, I don't know, we're, we're kind of booked for next week, but uh, the meet, first meeting in September. That would coincide nicely with the uh, return of flu season and maybe put some residents at ease about what systems are in place for us going into the fall. Okay, so I will place that on the agenda. If I can just ask Mr. Kazmark. If you can give Carlo a call and let him know that he'll be presenting to the council the first meeting in September. Will do. Thank you, Mr. Kazmark. Uh, anything else from members of council or administration? Okay, seeing none. At this time, we're gonna go ahead and move along to ordinances. Since this is an agenda meeting and there is no action, I just asked the council and the administration to review the ordinances on the agenda. And if you have any questions or concerns, please speak now. I have a question on um, the first ordinance. Okay. It's talking about establishing a Department of Recreation. So I would like to see some type of organization chart on this new department. So, Mike, if I may, um, this is really being done less to create a Department of recreation as much as it is to move the division of parks and forestry under the um, public works department for purposes of succession planning and i think we've we've discussed that prior to this yeah that's um, not a problem that's not my question though no i understand but what i what i would like to do is is maybe i can give you a call tomorrow um i i obviously won't be here to implement that but i have some ideas um, on how we should move forward on this or and how I think you guys should consider it moving forward. So, but I would prefer to have that talk offline one on one rather than have it at the council meeting until the council decides how they want to go forward. Okay, since um, we're going to vote on this next week, you, we need to share this information with the council before they vote. Sure, you, you and, if you and I can talk tomorrow, I'm sure we can formulate a plan. And if anything needs to change between now and next week, we can make that happen because you're actually not voting tonight. You'll be you'll right. be voting next week. Okay, thank you. Very good. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions or concerns from members of council with regards to ordinances? Okay, seeing none, nothing under non-consent agenda. Uh, we're moving now to the consent agenda. Again, I ask the council administration to review the items under the consent agenda. If you have any questions or concerns, Okay, uh, seeing none, we're going to go ahead right into uh, adjournment then. Take a motion. Second. A motion to adjourn the meeting made by Mr. Paul Cariffi. Seconded by Ms. Janice McCarthy. Roll call. Uh, Mr. Cariffi. Yes. Ms. Grignani. Yes. <clears throat> Ms. McCarthy? 
Yes. Ms. Peterson? Yes. Mr. DePiro? Yes. Okay, at this time the meeting is adjourned. I wish everyone a, a good night and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.